Hello everybody, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Physics Lectures. Last time we discussed and derived the multi-group diffusion equations, and today we're going to discuss a critical part of these diffusion equations, how to compute the multi-group cross-sections that are used in these equations. As I mentioned briefly last time, the multi-group diffusion equations can actually be extremely accurate if we feed them accurate cross-sections. So how do we determine these cross-sections? Because the cross-sections themselves are relatively well-known and relatively accurately measured, getting the multi-group average cross-sections is really a matter of getting accurate estimates for the energy-dependent neutron flux. And today we'll discuss how this flux varies as a function of energy in a nuclear reactor, or a typical light water reactor. When we calculate multi-group cross-sections for some group G and for the reaction X, our goal is really to preserve reaction rates, such as fission rates, neutron capture rates, etc., in our reactor. Let's assume that we can calculate some reference reaction rates using an extremely accurate code, such as a many-group transport code or a Monte Carlo code like MCMP. Our reaction rate for reaction X in group G is the integral over the energy bounds for group G of the continuous energy cross-section times the continuous energy flux. Here, E sub G is the lower energy for that group, and E sub G minus 1 is the upper energy bound. This might be a little confusing, but remember that group 1 is the lowest group, which means that E G minus 1 should be higher than E sub G. If we have the right multigroup cross-section, this reference reaction rate will also be equal to the multigroup average cross-section for reaction X and group G times the group average flux for group G. Thus, we can rearrange the terms to give that the multigroup average cross-section is equal to our reference reaction rate divided by our multigroup average flux, which is also the ratio of these two integrals here. So what is our energy-dependent flux, and how does phi vary as a function of energy? If we have a good understanding of the energy-dependent flux, we should be able to estimate our reaction rate reasonably well. The general process for determining these reference reaction rates, energy-dependent fluxes, and multi-group average cross-sections is as follows. First, we solve for phi of E using a large number of energy groups, but with a very simplified geometry. For example, in Oak Ridge's scale code package, the centrum code does just this. It solves for a continuous energy flux, meaning a flux that actually has hundreds of thousands of groups, and it solves for this flux using either a 0D or a 1D transport code, which is really not too dissimilar from the codes that you're writing right now in this course. Once we have a reference many group flux, we use these fluxes to generate the reference reaction rates, and thus, according to the equations above, can generate the multigroup cross-sections. Now that we have some multigroup cross-sections, the third step is to use them in our diffusion equation to solve for the multigroup fluxes, the power distribution, the flux distribution, etc. So you see that this process involves a trade-off. At first we use a lot of fidelity for the energy dependence of the system, and we gradually use less and less energy fidelity and more spatial fidelity. Ideally, we would solve for continuous energy fluxes while using a complicated 3D geometry, but this approach creates way more unknowns than we can actually handle. This number of unknowns is at least equal to the number of energy groups times the number of spatial cells, and because of memory limitations, we generally have to use either a lot of energy groups or a lot of spatial cells, never both. So what does this flux look like as a function of energy? It turns out that the flux has three distinct regimes, the thermal regime, the slowing down regime, and the fast energy regime. Note that these fluxes are plotted here as a function of the log of energy on this plot. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail in a minute, but to summarize things, in the thermal regime, our flux assumes the shape of a Maxwellian distribution, which is also the distribution of energy for atoms in a system at some given temperature. If you change the temperature of the system, the Maxwellian distribution will change shape too. At slowing down energies, our energy distribution is a 1 over E distribution, and we'll actually derive why this is in a minute. Lastly, at fast energies, our neutron distribution resembles the chi spectrum. 
It's important to know how neutrons scatter in each of these energy regimes because it often affects the shape of distribution. For thermal energies, our scatter is dominated by scattering events between neutrons and actually atoms that are about the same in energy, which again here are at thermal energies. For slowing down energies, we predominantly see elastic scatter that is S-wave scatter, which means that it's isotropic in the center of mass frame. For fast energies, this changes when we see either anisotropic or P-wave elastic scatters or actually in elastic scattering reactions. Now what about upscatter? It turns out that we don't have upscatter at fast or slowing down energies, but we do have upscatter at thermal energies. This is because at such low energies, the atoms will sometimes have more kinetic energy than our neutrons, which means that they can actually transfer energy to the neutrons instead of the neutrons transferring energy to them, which is what usually happens. Lastly, what kinds of cross-sections dictate the shape of the flux for each energy regime? For thermal energies, we are of course influenced by the 1 over V cross-section behavior, but we are actually also influenced by molecular effects. At these energies, the energy of the bonds between molecules is actually very similar to the energy of our neutrons. So molecules or even crystalline structures of atoms will actually diffract neutrons, making them behave like waves instead of particles. In the world of nuclear data, S alpha beta cross-sections describe how this diffraction can change the thermal cross-sections of different materials based on the molecular structure of those materials. At slowing down energies, our flux is strongly influenced by resolved resonances, which is something we'll discuss more in the next lecture. In the fast energy range, our flux spectrum is influenced by fast energy cross-sections and by unresolved resonances. Now let's talk more about what the flux spectrum looks like in each of these energy regimes. In a lot of ways, the flux can be treated as if it's completely separate in each of these regimes, and as if each regime influences the flux somewhat independently of the other regimes. As we discussed before, at thermal energies, the neutron energy distribution is in equilibrium with the energy distribution of atoms in the material, which causes the neutrons to also follow a roughly Maxwellian distribution. However, several phenomena can make our neutron flux non-Maxwellian. The first of these phenomena is spectral hardening, which raises the average energy of our flux. We call that the absorption cross-section for thermal neutrons follows roughly a 1 over V trend. This means that lower energy neutrons are more likely to be absorbed than higher energy neutrons. Spectral hardening describes how absorption will preferentially favor removing slower neutrons from our system, which actually results in a neutron energy distribution that has comparatively fewer low energy neutrons and more higher energy neutrons than an ideal Maxwellian energy distribution. In practice, spectral hardening describes any change to a system that preferentially removes lower energy neutrons from that system. An example of this is the addition of a strong thermal neutron absorber, such as boron. Now, spectral softening describes the opposite, which is any change that lowers the average energy of neutrons in our system. One phenomenon that causes spectral softening is diffusion cooling. If we plot the leakage probability of neutrons, we see that higher energy neutrons are more likely to leak because they diffuse farther than thermal energy neutrons. This results in a preferential loss of higher energy neutrons, which lowers the average energy of neutrons in our system. In general, spectral hardening tends to be more significant than diffusion cooling and spectral softening, but reactor designers will sometimes modify their designs to intentionally soften the neutron spectrum and increase the reactivity of our fuel. Water rods are one such modification. With water rods, we actually replace fuel rods in parts of the core, and specifically in parts that are starved of thermal neutrons, with just additional water moderator. This provides extra moderation in a much needed region of the core, which creates more thermal neutrons, and it actually saves money by not using fuel in suboptimal regions of the reactor. For fast energies, the neutron spectrum resembles the chi distribution, which again describes the energy of neutrons emitted by fission events. The fission spectrum dictates the fast neutron spectrum because fast neutrons really haven't had enough time to downscatter. 
so they essentially stay at the energy at which they were born. This certainly changes as you get closer to the boundary between the fast regime and the slowing down regime, as neutrons in this area will have started to have collisions and lose energy. When designing the fast reactors, we generally try and keep the neutron flux as fast as possible because the capture to fission ratio decreases as the neutron energy increases. Thus, fast reactors will try to avoid incorporating low Z materials, which can remove more energy from a neutron per collision, and stick with high Z materials. The slowing down range is where things get interesting. As we discuss this regime, we'll start by proving that the flux spectrum in the slowing down range roughly follows a 1 over E distribution. And in the future, we'll discuss how many scatter events are, on average, necessary for a particle to slow down. And then we'll also predict how many neutrons are absorbed by resonances while they slow down. To understand the slowing down flux spectrum, we begin by considering the zeroth moment of the Boltzmann transport equation. From here, we make several assumptions. First, we assume that we have an infinite medium of homogeneous material, which causes the current gradient to equal zero. This assumption is, of course, not true in any reactor, because all reactors are finite systems, but this assumption isn't so bad when we have some pretty thick water reflector regions. Next, we'll assume that the material we interact with is hydrogen, and that our hydrogen is a purely scattering material. This is also, of course, not true. There are other materials in the system, but the portion of neutrons that are absorbing the fuel will, will be accounted for when we discuss resonance absorption. The absorption cross-section for hydrogen, which is of course the prevalent moderator for light water reactors, is roughly 110 times smaller than the scattering cross-section. So this assumption is really not that bad for hydrogen. Lastly, we'll assume that we have no source of neutrons in this slowing down regime other than the neutrons that are slowing down. This implies that no fission neutrons are born into the slowing down regime, which is essentially what we assumed when we decided to divide the flux into these three energy regimes. From here, our Boltzmann transport equation reduces to say that our collisional term, sigma x times the flux, is equal to the scattering source of neutrons. Now for S-wave scattering, which is the prevalent form of scattering in the slowing down regime, it's safe to assume that the scattering events are isotropic in the center of mass frame, which means that we can use our derivation from earlier in the course to reduce our differential scattering cross-section into sigma s divided by 1 minus alpha and also divided by e prime. For hydrogen, alpha equals 0, so this term is just sigma s divided by e prime. Thus, our scattering source becomes the integral over all energies of sigma s of E prime times the flux of E prime. Now we'll define some term F of E, which is equal to sigma S times the flux. This simplifies our slowing down equation to F of E equals the integral of F of E prime divided by E prime. Taking the derivative of both sides yields this expression, where the derivative of F is equal to F over E, evaluated at the upper and lower energy bounds for our previous scattering source integral. Now what are the upper and lower energy bounds of this integral? Well, for a neutron with initial energy EI, the maximum energy it can scatter to is also just EI, and the minimum energy it can scatter to is alpha times EI. Now if we work backwards and consider a neutron with some final energy EF, then the maximum energy it could have had before the scatter event is EF divided by alpha and the minimum energy it could have had before the scatter is just EF, meaning that the particle lost no energy during the scattering event. These two values happen to be the values of Emax and Emin in our previous equation. Because A equals 1 for hydrogen, alpha is 0, and Emax is equal to infinity. Thus, our first F over E term becomes 0. For our second term, Emin is actually equal to the current energy of the particle, E, which means that our equation has become a differential equation that we can now solve. Taking the integral of this equation gives that the log of f is equal to the negative log of e, which is just the log of 1 over e. From here we can see that f is equal to 1 over e, 
which allows us to then solve for the neutron flux. Because our scattering cross-section is relatively constant for hydrogen, especially in the slowing down range, this means that our flux is simply equal to 1 over E in the slowing down range. We have all just survived a crash course into how the flux varies as a function of energy in a typical light water reactor. Next time we'll discuss how many scatters are necessary for a neutron to slow down, and then we'll begin discussing how likely it is for neutrons to be absorbed by resonances in the fuel while the neutrons are slowing down.